The Catholic Church burned people alive for cooking like this. They called it witchcraft, devil worship, heresy. But when modern scientists tested these exact techniques in laboratories, they found something that made them question everything we thought we knew about medieval intelligence. Medieval peasants figured out something that took modern science centuries to explain. They packed fresh meat in wood ash, just plain ash from their cooking fires, and it actually worked. Here's why this is genius. Wood ash has a pH between 10 and 12. That's almost as alkaline as bleach. Bacteria absolutely hate that environment. They show up, try to colonize your pork shoulder, and immediately die like vampires in sunlight. A single layer of ash could keep meat safe for three weeks. No refrigeration, no chemicals, just the stuff you'd normally sweep out of your fireplace. But the church wasn't thrilled about this trick. See, if peasants could preserve their own meat, they'd stop buying from licensed butchers. Those butchers paid guild taxes. Those taxes funded important things, like more taxes. So authorities banned the practice for common folk. The funny part? Remote villages in Eastern Europe never got the memo. They still use this exact method today for game meat. But ash preservation was just the beginning. Wait until you hear what they did with fish guts. Here's the thing about medieval cooks. They hated waste, like genuinely despised it. So when they had buckets of fish guts sitting around, they didn't toss them. They fermented them into a sauce called garum. Sounds disgusting, right? Well, the Catholic Church agreed. They banned production in tons of towns because the smell was sinful and apparently attracted every rat within a five-mile radius. But here's what those church officials missed. This stinky fish paste was basically medieval MSG. Scientists now know it was absolutely loaded with natural glutamates, the same compounds that make everything taste better. One tablespoon packed more protein than a whole serving of fresh fish because fermentation concentrated everything good. And the bacteria situation? completely handled. The fermentation process destroyed harmful pathogens while creating probiotics that actually helped digestion. Modern chefs now pay premium prices for Asian fish sauces made the exact same way. 2,000 years later, and we're still copying medieval garbage disposal methods, but fermented fish wasn't the only liquid getting medieval people in trouble. Here's the thing about medieval well water. It was basically a bacterial swimming pool, and people knew something was off even if they couldn't see the microscopic nightmare lurking in every sip. So housewives started splashing vinegar into their drinking water, just a little, enough to give it a slight tang. Town authorities went absolutely mental over this. Fines everywhere. Their logic? Vinegar was a taxable commodity, and peasants were wasting it on water purification instead of buying it through proper channels. Classic government thinking, right? But here's what modern labs discovered. A 1% vinegar solution absolutely demolishes E. coli and salmonella. We're talking dead bacteria within minutes. The acetic acid basically punches holes in bacterial cell membranes until the germs fall apart. Families using this trick had way lower rates of dysentery during those brutal summer months when water turned into liquid death. Roman soldiers called this drink Pasca. It kept armies marching for over 500 years, now, speaking of keeping things from killing you, here's the thing about copper pots. They're fantastic for even heat distribution. Chefs still swear by them today. But there's a catch. When acidic foods hit bare copper, something nasty happens. A greenish residue forms. That's copper acetate. And yeah, it'll make you violently sick. Medieval cooks figured out a workaround that's honestly brilliant. They coated the inside of their copper pots with rendered lard before each use. The fat created a barrier between the food and the metal. Guild regulations in many cities banned home cooks from maintaining their own copper pots. You had to pay licensed tinkers for that privilege. Convenient for the tinkers, expensive for everyone else. Modern metallurgists tested this technique and confirmed it actually works. The fat forms a lipid barrier that blocks copper ions from leaching into your tomato sauce or wine reduction. And here's why lard worked better than olive oil. Saturated fats solidify when cool, creating a stable coating that stays put. They basically invented non-stick cookware 600 years before DuPont got around to it, but protecting your pots was only half the battle. Protecting your cheese? That required something with a bit more sting. Stinging nettles. Those plants that make your skin burn if you accidentally brush against them. 
Medieval cheesemakers grabbed these things on purpose and wrapped their cheese wheels in them. Sounds insane. But here's what they figured out. The same chemicals that make your hand swell up, they also kill mold. Formic acid and natural antifungals coat every leaf, creating a hostile environment for the fuzzy green stuff that ruins cheese. Feudal lords actually banned peasants from harvesting nettles on estate land. Not because they cared about cheese, but because nettles made rope and cloth that competed with taxed flax products. Classic move. Meanwhile, the cheese wrapped in these forbidden leaves developed beautiful protective rinds while staying creamy inside for months. Those tiny stinging hairs? They created air pockets that regulated humidity perfectly. Nature's climate control. Want proof this wasn't just medieval luck? English Yard Cheese still uses nettle wrapping today and sells for premium prices at fancy shops. But nettles weren't the only surprising wrapper. Wait until you hear what they did with leftover dairy. Here's the thing about medieval grain. It was packed with nutrients your body couldn't actually use. Phytic acid. That's the villain here. It binds to iron and zinc like a greedy little molecule that refuses to share. Medieval millers figured out a workaround. They'd soak wheat and barley and leftover whey for a day or two before grinding. The stuff nobody wanted. Cheese water, basically. Church authorities had a problem with this. Whey came from milk, which meant it counted as dairy during Lent. So this clever preservation trick? Technically a sin for half the year. But the science is wild. That acidic whey bath broke down the phytic acid completely. Bread made from soaked grain delivered up to 50% more absorbable minerals than regular bread. The lactic acid also kick-started fermentation. People with touchy stomachs could suddenly eat bread without spending the afternoon regretting it. We now sell this exact concept as sprouted grain bread for $8 a loaf. Speaking of making things last longer, medieval smokehouses had secrets too. Juniper. Most people think of gin. Medieval cooks thought of survival. They'd hang meat and fish in smoke chambers burning juniper branches instead of regular wood. Not just for flavor, for chemistry. Here's what nobody knew back then, but scientists proved recently. Juniper smoke contains alpha-pinene and sabinine. Fancy names, simple job, they kill listeria and other nasty bacteria dead. Meat smoked over juniper lasted twice as long as stuff smoked over oak or beech. Twice! That's the difference between eating well and starving before spring. But good luck getting your hands on juniper. Forest laws in England and Germany restricted harvesting because nobles wanted those berries for their fancy drinks. Peasants preserving food? Not a priority. The pine-like taste also covered up meat that was getting a bit... mature. Less waste, more meals. Scandinavians never stopped using this trick. Their juniper-smoked salmon sells for hundreds per pound today. Now, speaking of expensive preservation methods, honey did double duty in medieval kitchens. Here's the thing about honey. Medieval cooks slathered it on roasting meat, and everyone assumed they just had a sweet tooth. Nope. They noticed meat glazed with honey didn't develop that suspicious green slime nearly as fast as unglazed meat. Monasteries hoarded the stuff like gold, officially for wound care and making church candles. Kitchen use? Frowned upon. Monks guarded their beehives jealously. Turns out they were onto something huge. Honey has almost no water in it. Bacteria need moisture to survive, and honey basically sucks the life out of them through osmosis. Brutal way to go, honestly. Plus, honey naturally produces small amounts of hydrogen peroxide. Yes, the same stuff you pour on cuts. A good honey glaze created an airtight barrier on cooked meat. Extended safe eating time by days. No refrigeration needed. The kicker? Modern hospitals now use medical-grade honey to treat antibiotic-resistant infections. Medieval cooks figured this out by accident, but honey wasn't the only paste-preserving food back then. Here's the thing about mustard. We think of it as something you squirt on a hot dog. Medieval cooks, they saw it as a weapon against death. They'd grind mustard seeds with vinegar until it formed a thick paste. Then they'd slather it all over raw meat before storage. Sounds like weird flavor choices, right? Wrong. The Crown actually taxed prepared condiments, making home mustard production illegal in some regions. Why? Because they knew it worked too well. Peasants with mustard paste didn't need to buy freshly slaughtered meat every few days. Scientists eventually figured out the magic ingredient, allyl isothiocyanate. That's the chemical that makes your nose burn when you eat too much. 
But here's what medieval folks couldn't have known. That same compound destroys bacteria, fungi, and even parasitic worm eggs on contact. A ham coated in mustard paste could survive an entire winter in a cellar. But preservation wasn't just about meat. Some people were hiding eggs by the hundreds. Here's the thing about eggs. They spoil fast. Like, embarrassingly fast. Leave them out for a few weeks and you've got a stink bomb, not breakfast. Medieval farm wives figured out something brilliant. They dropped fresh eggs into buckets of water mixed with slaked lime. Basically, calcium hydroxide. Sounds like a chemistry experiment. It was. The alkaline solution did something clever. It plugged up every microscopic pore in the shell with calcium cristite, completely airtight. No air gets in, no bacteria gets in, egg stays fresh. How fresh? Two years fresh. Seriously. Blind taste tests showed people couldn't tell the difference between lime-preserved eggs and ones laid that morning. Manor lords hated this trick. They demanded fresh eggs as rent payment. Peasants preserving their own eggs? That's basically tax evasion with breakfast food. The method worked so well that during World War II, the U.S. Department of Agriculture officially recommended it during egg shortages. One bucket of lime water, a few pennies, over a hundred preserved eggs. But eggs weren't the only thing getting unexpected additives. Here's the thing about medieval flower storage. Weevils, those tiny beetles that turn your grain into a squirming nightmare. Miller's had a secret weapon that sounds absolutely insane. Charcoal powder, mixed right into the flour. Sounds like they were ruining perfectly good food, right? Royal inspectors certainly thought so. They handed out fines for adulterating flour with additives. Didn't matter that the additive actually worked. Just a single tablespoon per bushel absorbed all that excess moisture weevils need to thrive. The charcoal also soaked up ethylene gas, which speeds up spoilage in basically everything. But here's the clever part most people miss. Stored grain develops this slightly rancid off taste after a few weeks. The charcoal neutralized that too. Bread tasted fresh even when the flour was months old. Modern grain silos, they use silica gel packets for the exact same purpose. Works identically. Costs way more. The inspectors who banned this trick probably never wondered why some millers never had weevil problems. Speaking of storage secrets that got people in trouble with the law, here's the thing about beans. Medieval people loved them. Cheap protein that grew almost anywhere. But they also knew beans could turn your stomach into a war zone. So they figured out a trick. Drop a strip of pork fat into the pot. Let it simmer alongside the beans for hours. Suddenly, no more painful bloating. No more clearing the room after dinner. Peasants swore by this method. Problem was, sumptuary laws sometimes restricted their access to pork products entirely. The nobility didn't want common folk eating above their station which accidentally banned one of the best digestive aids ever discovered. Modern gastroenterologists finally cracked the code. Fat slows down your digestion, giving gut bacteria extra time to process those tricky bean sugars that cause gas. The slow-cooked fat also releases compounds that break down the indigestible stuff before it becomes a problem. Ever notice how Boston baked beans and French cassoulet always include pork belly? Now, curing meat required something even stranger scraped from stable floors. Here's the thing about medieval butchers. They were literally scraping crystals off barn walls and stable floors. Sounds disgusting, right? But those white crusts were saltpeter, and they turned ordinary pork into ham that lasted for months. The Crown absolutely hated this. Why? Because saltpeter was the key ingredient in gunpowder. Kings needed every grain of it for their cannons and muskets. So scraping it for bacon? Technically treason in some places. But butchers did it anyway because the results were incredible. Chemistry explains why. Saltpeter converts to nitrite during the curing process. That nitrite specifically targets botulism spores, the deadly bacteria that thrive in oxygen-free environments like cured meat. Without it, your ham becomes a biological weapon. There's another bonus too. Saltpeter gives cured meat that distinctive pink color. Skip it, and you get gray ham. Nobody wants gray ham. Modern manufacturers still use the exact same compound. They just make it in labs instead of scraping it from horse stalls. Speaking of unexpected preservation methods, here's the thing about oxygen. It's a silent killer for preserved food. Medieval cooks figured this out the hard way. Their solution? 
pour a thick layer of melted beef sweet right over whatever they wanted to save. The fat would cool, harden, and create a seal tighter than a miser's wallet. But authorities weren't happy. Tallow and sweet were taxed commodities, mainly reserved for candle making. Using them for food storage? Technically wasteful, sometimes outright illegal. And yet, it worked beautifully. Food scientists now confirm that solid fat caps block both oxygen and airborne bacteria from reaching the preserved contents. No oxygen means no oxidation. No bacteria means no spoilage. Simple as that. Potted meat sealed this way stayed perfectly safe for over six months. No refrigeration needed. Just a cool cellar and some beef fat. Ever had French confit duck? Expensive stuff. Fancy restaurants charge a fortune for it. Same exact technique. Same medieval principle. Speaking of techniques that became high-end. And finally, the trick that would get you arrested for tax evasion. Medieval bakers figured out something brilliant. They'd stuff bread dough inside clay pots, seal the lid with more dough, then bake the whole thing. Basically, a pressure cooker made of dirt. Why was this banned? Guild regulations. You had to use the town's licensed ovens where inspectors checked every loaf. Home baking in secret pots? That's cheating the system. But here's what those bakers understood before anyone else. The sealed pot traps steam. That steam keeps the crust soft while the inside rises like crazy. The result? Fluffy, artisan-quality bread instead of the usual medieval hockey pucks. The clay also spread heat evenly. No more burnt bottoms with raw centers. This technique sat forgotten for centuries until around 2009 when no-knead Dutch oven bread went viral online. People thought they discovered something revolutionary. Nope. Just medieval peasants outsmarting the taxman 600 years earlier. Some things never change. 